The most efficient and economical means of transportation ever developed is the modern steam railroad system. And although a steam locomotive had not been conceived in the mind of man, and railroad tracks had not even been dreamed of at the time our story begins, yet we're going to show you how a great American laid the foundations for one of the world's greatest railroads and securely fixed the young nation in its place in the world with the bonds of transportation. 25 years after George Washington had passed to the immortal, the steam locomotive made its appearance. Railroads sprang up along the old routes of travel. Small, scattered short lines were built and then hooked together. The Richmond and Allegheny Railroad took over all the rights of way and appurtenances of the James River Company, and George Washington's canal became a railroad. Other lines built along the route of the Midland Trail were expanded, then combined. And finally, all found their way into the Chesapeake and Ohio lines of today. George Washington's Railroad, built on the routes he selected. And here we see George Washington's Railroad as it is today, smoothing the road, making easy the way between East and West, as Washington predicted in his letter to Governor Harrison. Start at the wonderful city of Cincinnati, first named the Port Washington. This new Cincinnati Union Terminal, where we board the George Washington, is one of the most magnificent structures ever built for the convenience and comfort of travel. It is used by seven railroads and costs $40 million. When you play bridge or poker, you ought to think of Cincinnati, because more playing cards are made here than in any other city in the world. When you wash your hands or face, take a bath, you ought to think of Cincinnati because the first bathtub in the United States was here, and it leads the world in making soap. It had the first steam fire engine, the first machine gun, and the first professional baseball club. Cincinnati has half again more telephones than any other city of its size. And here's the George Washington, leader of the finest fleet of air-conditioned trains in the world. Glance at one of the great, almost human machines which wheels you swiftly and safely through the night while you sleep like a kitten. It's not only a locomotive, it's a traveling pump plant. Loaded with 20 tons of coal and 16,000 gallons of water, this mechanical wonder is going to convert 4,000 gallons of water into steam every 60 minutes. And into its giant furnace is going to go every hour two tons of the finest coal in the world. But the fireman doesn't have to shovel it like he used to. He just turns this little gadget and machinery does it more scientifically and more effectively than a man could do it with a shovel. But the fireman still has plenty to do and plenty of responsibility. He's the engineer's right-hand man. Here's the engineer, a fine citizen, a man who owns his own home and sends his boys and girls to college. He's able, cool-headed, resourceful, and experienced or he wouldn't be in the cab of the George Washington. This is the man who does your driving for you when you travel by rail. Peering through the fog and storm when the airplanes are grounded and the trucks and motor cars are stalled in snow drifts, he's the man who drives every day in the year, no matter what the anything. He has to fight the road hogs at the crossing and dodge the nitwits who want to race the train. He spent many long, hard years as a fireman before the company ever trusted him with a locomotive. He brings you safely and comfortably to your destination. All is part of the day's work. There is only one place where you are safer than when riding with him, and that's in your own bed at home. While you're easy and comfortable back in your car, don't forget the engineer. Food is an important part of traveling. Here it is, going aboard the tavern car. It's the best food obtainable in any market, and the highest prices are paid to get. In and out of season, you get nothing but fresh food. All aboard. We're off on the George Washington, the world's most famous passenger train. on the train. Here's one quite different. 
It is designed for passengers who do not wish Pullman accommodations and exemplifies the policy of giving the very finest of transportation for just the price of the railroad ticket. It seats only 45 people, no crowding, you see, and has real individual chairs for every passenger. They turn in any direction. Couples or parties of two or four or six can foregather here. It is fully carpeted, has individual reading lights, and if you're a big butter and egg man and want to work while you ride, that's easy, or you can have a table. There's a women's lounge room, too, for making a toilet or taking a smoke. We had trouble at first convincing passengers that there was no extra charge. Now, right here in the most convenient location in the train is a tavern car. It's not called the dining car because it isn't like anything you've known as a diner. You'll notice it looks more like a dining room. Spotless linen, shining silver, gleaming glassware, all like a first-class restaurant. The delicate colonial tableware was designed to delight your eye. The walls are refreshing light shades of early American colonial, which would have to be kept clean if genuine air conditioning didn't keep them that way. But it does. The meals are cooked by experienced chefs, and if what you want isn't on the menu, one of them probably knows how to cook it and will be glad to do so. Next time you're on a tavern car, ask the steward to take you through the kitchen. You'll be glad to, and you'll marvel at what cooks can do in such small space, and how spotless and ship shape everything is. But seeing is believing. Here's the Mount Vernon dinner. the tavern dinner. It's a he-man's meal for anybody. But the Mount Vernon dinner is the favorite. First is a choice of relishes. This man likes a fruit cocktail. Then there's a choice of soup. This fellow likes consomme. Then there's always fish, fowl, and meat. This two-fisted chap likes a steak. And look at it. A steak is a steak. And with it, any kind of potatoes, choice of other vegetables, a salad, a choice among six desserts, and whatever you like to drink. Chesapeake in Ohio doesn't make any money on this dinner. It couldn't possibly do that, for there isn't enough volume of business on any train to make a dining car profitable. But we're not selling food. We're selling transportation. Oh, incidentally, we don't prohibit passengers from doing anything in our tavern cars that they like to do in their own home. The steward will invite you to have a cigarette. Here's a lounge car mid-train for the convenience of folks who don't want to walk way through to the observation end. And we call this the library, because it's quiet here for those who want to read or work. After a good meal, the observation lounge is a comfortable place to settle down. Newspapers, magazines, stock market reports, and sporting bulletins to read. And then, of course, there's the radio, with the music of your favorite orchestra. There's no reason why you should be cut off from the world when you travel. Radio keeps you in touch with the news of the day. But if you want to rest and relax, forget the busy world and look at the marvelous country and the interesting places as you speed along. Augusta, Kentucky was settled by revolutionary soldiers in 1785, the same year George Washington's railroad was founded. It's the only town in the world built on the bones of unknown people. Here, the first Methodist college west of the Alleghenies was located. are entering Ashland to rejoin the train from Cincinnati. The setting sun is dipped below the rim of the haze and shrouded hill which frame the course of the beautiful Ohio. It's almost bedtime. The travelers who are going to sleep like kittens and arrive fresh as daisy are making ready to enjoy a night of genuine air conditioning. There's no mystery about this modern magic which banishes excess humidity, noise and dirt. It's almost too simple to be true. The sleeping cars on the George Washington have accommodations to suit anybody's taste. Single burrs and single sections, of course, for those who prefer them, with real coil spring mattresses, regular miniature box springs, just like you have at home. 
Maybe for the family, you want a room or a suite of rooms with individual accessories. The George Washington has those, too. Then, if you want privacy, here's a single bedroom. By day, it's a luxurious apartment with a deep cushioned divan. At night, it's a private bedroom with private accessories and a bed six inches longer than a bird. Think of that, you long fellows who have been trying to be contortionists when you put on your pants in an upper. No use taking time to look at the other cars. They're all like this. Brilliantly lighted, cheerfully decorated, spotlessly clean, and of course, genuinely air conditioned. Each one is a traveling home with its own water system and power plant, and supplied with its linen, bed clothes, and other equipment for your comfort. It represents an investment of $40,000, or the equivalent of this splendid home. Sleep like a kitten and arrive fresh as a daisy are more than slogans. And now there are lots of other things going on all over this great railroad. You rarely see them and probably know little of them. So we're going to give you several quick glances. But the wonderful new river gorge combines them all. Deeper than the gorge of the Niagara, there's a riot of scenic grandeur through which we pass on our way to begin our ascent on the western slope of the Allegheny Mountains. One section of our train is going on to Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. But for the moment, we will remain with the other section, which is going on to Richmond, Newport News, Old Point, Comfort, and Norfolk. But before we go, we will look around this gateway to history land, the land where more American history has been made than in any other... Newport News, where Chesapeake and Ohio rails come down to Tidewater, is the largest terminal occupied by one railroad. George Washington's railroad enters the national capital at its front door, crossing the broad expanse of the historic Potomac. The visitor's first view as he leaves the great Union terminal is the dome of the capital on the site selected by Washington, its cornerstone laid by him. 